Welcome to Surfacing. In this two-part interview, hosts Lisa Welchman and Andy Vitale speak to information architect and author Peter Morville. In this episode, they discuss Peter's recent move to a farm in Virginia and the steep learning curve of becoming a farmer. Peter offers his perspective on the state of information architecture and talks about his methods for tackling IA projects with clients. Peter also considers some of the challenges that a new generation of designers and information architects face as they endeavor to build impactful digital experiences. So you did actually move during the pandemic, Peter. Is that true? Um, We moved twice during the pandemic. After after 25 years in Ann Arbor, Michigan, we moved twice during the pandemic uh, from Ann Arbor to Charlottesville, Virginia, to a little rental home in the woods uh, last August. That's right. I remember seeing that on Twitter. I remember. And you started doing these epic hikes. Yeah, that's one of the reasons that I picked this region was the Appalachian Mountains and the, the, the wonderful hiking. Um, and then just about five weeks ago, I think, we moved from the rental to what was hopefully our forever home, a 48-acre farm in Scottsville, um, Virginia. Forever home. I love that. What does that mean? <laughs> that means I want to die here. <laughs> <laughs> If if for no other reason, then I don't want to ever move again. So the rental home was sort of a tryout to see if you actually really wanted to be in the area or... It was was more of a, you know, it's a lot easier to look for a home when you're physically in the area, especially Ah. now when you need to move so quickly. Um, But, you know, we wanted to get a feel for the area, a sense of which part of, you know, I mean, we were sort of centered around Charlottesville because my wife really wanted to have it. Like, you know, we lived in Ann Arbor, which is this wonderful college town. And Charlottesville is also a wonderful college town. So that was kind of the anchor. Um, But we didn't know which, you know, which direction we wanted to be um, and how far from Charlottesville we could tolerate. Um, So we're about 25 minutes from Charlottesville now. Nice. I've been to Charlottesville. I've flown on this air this plane that I was on, it was like the little hopper propeller plane. And I had the first row and I thought, this is a great seat, but it happens that you're facing everyone else. It's almost the flight attendant seat. So I was knee to knee with the person in row two. And it was a really awkward flight, just staring someone in the eyes for 45 minutes. (laughs) But I love that town, but a 48 acre farm, like, are you actually farming on it or is just a house on some farmland? A bit of both. Um, so we, Virginia, I, I guess most states have some version of this, but there's this, there's sort of this notion of land use. Um, and if you're using your land for a government sanctioned kind of supposedly good for the people purpose, like farming, then you don't have to pay taxes on that portion of the land. So there's a very strong incentive to, to farm the land one way or the other. And so we worked out a deal with a local farmer um, who's one of my favorite people we've met down here. Um, And so he is growing hay in the 18 acre field um, to feed his cows. He's a cattle farmer. And then literally later today, he's bringing two calves over here and they're going to be in the field right outside our house. Um, And we're just going to like look after them for him for a while. And let them graze graze on the... Yeah. Yeah. So we're pretty excited to have our baby. I, 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 I fear that we're going to get very attached to our baby cows, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I was like, this is a cat, this is a cattle farmer and yeah. you're a vegetarian. Yeah. How does, how does, how does that work in your, in your mind? <laughs> well, according, according to our 19 year old daughter, we, we have become evil 
um, and complicit in the beef industry at this point, but um, I'm able to rationalize it a little more. Um, you know, I, first of all, I'm not actually fully morally against eating animals. I'm against industrial agriculture and factory farming and the cruelties to humans and animals that are part of that industry. But, you know, small farmers, you know, um, and I'm sure it varies by farmer, but, you know, a lot of small farmers care about their animals and do a pretty good job, job of looking after them. And they're, they're the ones with the happy cows, right? That at least when they're alive, they're getting to hang out in the field and graze and be with each other. And so it's not all bad. Um, but you know, these cows, these cows were sort of have their own destiny. We're just going to look after them for a little while. <laughs> yeah. 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 And hope, and hopefully nicely. And yeah, maybe you'll be friends when they're alive and yeah. And, and, uh, and it's not impossible that we will, <laughs> I mean, I don't even want to put it in, speak it into the world, but like I, I have, I have, I have envisioned a scenario in which we end up buying them from the farmer. <laughs> So we'll see. Yeah, your your daughter might be out with some protest signs, so you'll have yeah. to you'll have you'll have to see how that works. So this it's, is like it's 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 hard to not get attached though. So where I live, it, there's a little bit of woods in in North Carolina. I'm on the outskirts of Charlotte, but we've got chipmunks that that have mm. dug oh, holes no. and moved into our yard. Or you had them. Well, yeah, well <laughs> we saw them again, thankfully. Okay. But uh, they just had babies, and all of a sudden. We saw a five foot snake come and move into the chipmunk hole, mm. but the chipmunks wow. got out and they come back and we haven't seen the snake. But once I saw that snake, I was like, you know what? We're going to go ahead and redo this whole yard. Like we're going to make it like gravel instead of these, these hills that are there with the pine straw that they can dig into. And we planned that chipmunks eat from the bird feeder, like the birds throw out some seeds. So we ordered this four foot like planting tray so that the the excess bird seeds would fall into a tray that the squirrels and the chipmunks could eat and the snake won't live in in the gravel okay. so but now the snake's gone after we committed to like this big <laughs> investment in the backyard right. but just to prevent it ever happening again it's like the chipmunks are part of the family now yeah so you're and you're and you're you're doing your best to be good custodians of the of the land but it's that's harder right. <laughs> than it might seem um the well, I'm I'm just a city girl, so um, <laughs> I, I like I like being out in the wilderness, but I actually like being out in the wilderness, or I like being in a city. Mm, yeah, like two different things. I think I don't know. Did you ever end up going to do the Pixel Up conference in South Africa? I'm f well, I did it technically, but uh, it was a Zoom conference. Oh, it was point. a pandem pandemic pandemic yeah, thing so. or whatever. And I think I I had you had mentioned it like this Buddhist retreat center that yeah. was out in the middle of nowhere and, and which was really great. Like it was, a, it was a great place to go. I think I, I got there early and actually spent a, a week or two in advance of the conference and then went to the conference and did it. And I realized at that time, and it was out, not crazy out in the bush, but it was out there. Like we got lost trying to get there in the middle of the night. They had to talk us in. It was kind of like when you get to the third bush, um, turn left and then look really hard because that there's going to be a little street, you know, like, you know, yeah. unpaved path or whatever and got out in the middle of any, and nowhere. And so I really love being slightly terrified by, yeah. Yeah. by night sounds and wilderness sounds, which can happen if you live in a city a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, there, you know, we're all kinds of like, just, you know, big cats and monkeys and just stuff that was outside and, you know, insects and giant bushes that looked odd. Uh -huh. And just the, the cacophony that is what we have now, at least on the east coast of the cicadas, but was just every night there was that much noise. Yeah. Um, but there was also just this tremendous freedom of, you know, as a woman being able to walk alone at night and be mm. safe. Mm -hmm. Right. In a way that you don't really get in a city. And yeah. so um, it's really great that you're kind of out there. There's a freedom that comes with being on that expanse of land and there's dangers that come with it as well or different types of um, challenges, I guess, is a more positive way to put it. But it just makes you realize, realize uh, 
what human beings have given up for the sake of uh, civilizations. And I'm not yeah. negative about that. I'm really, I'm a city girl. I'm all <laughs> the opera, the jazz club, the public transportation. I'm all into that kind of stuff, but it's really interesting. So yeah. So as I was thinking this morning about this conversation, one theme that kind of popped into my mind that I think actually could be a thread that could tie together our conversations around farming and the wilderness with technology and work is the theme of fear. Um, and um, so, yeah, there's, I mean, I've experienced quite a bit of fear since we moved in here, fear of not being able to actually look after this place and, and keep up, um, fear of snakes, um, you know, because we've got <laughs> rattlesnakes and copperheads down here. Um, and we actually have a, our, 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 our next door neighbor, um, you can just about see their house if you look through the right window, but like they're through the trees and so forth. That's the only house you can see from here. How um, far is that? It's, it's not, they're not too far away, but you know, it's, it's easy to forget they're even there. Right. And, 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 and you know, mo mostly we, we actually do live in a neighborhood, but you wouldn't know it. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, for the first couple of weeks, my wife kept saying, I miss living in a neighborhood as our neighbors would come over and introduce themselves. And she even said it to them. And I'm like, Susan, you can't say you miss a neighborhood to your neighbors. Like, like <laughs> that's not they, starting well. <laughs> yeah. They, they feel that they live in a neighborhood. Um, and so it's just, it's just more rural, but people have been incredibly friendly and welcoming. Um, but like our, our next door neighbor, one of the first things he told, um, it was actually Susan who went and talked to him. Um, one of the first things he, he told her about was how his son rides around on the tractor when he's mowing the lawn with a loaded gun in case he sees copperheads. <laughs> and, you know, as it, it, to me, that's just such an interesting, provocative image, um, you know, around that concept of fear, right? Because I can completely identify with fear of snakes. Um, they scare the heck out of me. Um, but I also really empathize for snakes and I don't, I don't condone the just, you know, just kind of out of control killing of snakes. Um, and so like, you know, it's like, a, it's a weird thing where I have like these mixed feelings about, about that. Um, but, you know, fear is such a strong driver of human beliefs mm -hmm. and behaviors and a, and a huge amount of the time we don't even acknowledge it. Right. So it's like, you know, what, how people are interacting in a work setting is often driven by fear, but people don't even realize mm -hmm. that's what's shaping what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, that is that is really, really resonates with me, both personally and professionally. Um, you know, relationships, decisions that you make out of fear, you know, mm -hmm. interpersonal, personal, intimate, romantic relationships, decisions that you make out of fear. Yeah. But also when I'm interacting with clients, and, you know, trying to help them get organized and try to m help them make changes in how they collaborate so that they can do what they say they want to do, which is make good stuff. And, you know, just most of the time, the reason they can't shift is this like clinging fear, right? Like, I'm afraid to make the shift. At least mm. I know the way my group works now. I know the way we're interacting. I understand my power. Right, right now. And if I let this go and I actually collaborate with these other people and in particular behave in a way that allows other people to have power, if I do that, then, you know, what am I going to lose? I'm afraid I'm going to lose something. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's practical. Um, maybe I won't get that raise and I really need the money to pay the college tuition. But, you know, most of the time, it really isn't that tangible. It really is like in their bone, like this power thing. And I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm wondering just how much do you think that tendency to be afraid has sort of landed us in the complex spot that we're in now when it comes to, you know, the design particularly of, you know, we focus a lot of, on digital in this podcast of what we're putting online, it's particularly as it relates to the people who are making it. Right. Where we are, you know, I like to beat up a little bit on designers, you know, on this podcast mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, but we don't really talk about them as people that much. We talk about them as designers, right, mm -hmm. in a functional role 
and less as human beings. And I'm wondering just, you know, you've been in this world for so long and helped to shape and form this world of design. And I want to talk about that a little bit more, differences between UX, information architecture, all of it, what your opinion is on on that. But what about the people? How do you think they're doing and what do you think the contribution of that their, their state is to what we're seeing and happening right now? Yeah. Whew. So it's funny because the project I'm working on right now um, is it's kind of rare for me these days, but it's more of an internal knowledge management project. And, um, and so I'm working with this big nonprofit and I'm working with their legal department. Um, and let me tell you, getting the contract <laughs> worked out <laughs> yeah. was, was crazy. Um, but, but they've been actually wonderful to work with. They're spread out all around the world. And, um, and, and people are, it's, it's one of the most fragmented information environments I've ever seen because every location has its own server, shared server. And so you've got two or three or four people in one location who are sharing files with each other. And then most people who are not in that location don't have access to those files, um, even with, like, within the global legal department. Interesting. And, 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 and this has kind of evolved, you know, largely due to fear of, of, right, these are confidential files. We have to be careful. We have to protect our clients. Um, and, and then some, and somewhat just due to like IT inertia, like nobody ever <laughs> figured out a way yeah. to make it open by default rather than closed by default. And so they actually have a really really good culture like if 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 somebody from you know hawaii emails someone from the philippines and says hey can i have access to your server so we can work together they'll they'll just be like oh sure let's make that happen and so they really share well with each other when you know when when specific needs come up but they're completely fragmented and cut off from and, and so you know when, when i when i do do like interviews with folks there and I asked them is searching a challenge th their answer is sort of like no because they don't search there's like <laughs> they're not they're not able to like they're oh they're like just know, the foundational things aren't there to allow them to do that yeah right. like usually if uh, usually on an engagement like this I would be observing them search the intranet yeah and it would be horrible right because it's yeah. like you know the search system yeah. is terrible and, the, and the, the result, <laughs> yeah, and the, you know, and the information's out of date, but at least you could watch people, f you know, failing at search. Whereas here you really don't even, it doesn't even occur to you to try because you, you don't even have access to most stuff. So what do they do to look for things? Well, they email each other, they call each other. Hey, you know, do you know anything about this? They do all group, you know, they, they, they email all you know, I don't even know how many people there are, right? Like anybody know anything about this topic, you know, let me know. And um, so it's, it, you know, there's a plus to that, right? It's like, because they end up talking with each other a lot across geographies and getting to know each other. So there's that high touch kind of, you know, positive, but there's also tremendous amounts of, of wasted time and missed opportunities and just like acting based on not having the information, reinventing the wheel and, um, but it, yeah, fear um, is a big piece of that, and it's contributed to like a you know pr incredibly fragmented information environment. You know, when I think about the flip side, which is kind of what you're were more asking about, was, which is like uh, you know I think more like public facing websites, right, and people who are designing for for consumers or and I'm I'm trying to think like you know what what is the role of fear there? I feel like. Um, you know, I'm not sure if I have good recent experiences. I tend to think that the problems more come just from, um, you know, cultures where, I mean, everyone talks about user-centered design, right? Like I've never seen user-centered design ever. Yeah. Like nobody does it, right? Like it's, it's executive-centered design, yep. stakeholder-centered design, designer-centered design, like, you know, comfort-centered design, like, is this easier to do it this way? Technology-centered design, like, it's, you know, nobody actually gets even very close to 
designing for users. And even when they do, it doesn't last. Like, you know, Amazon for a long time did a pretty awesome yeah, job yeah, yeah, they did. with their website. Yeah. <laughs> and in the last 10 years, it's gotten horrible um, because they just couldn't sustain that focus. It, you know, the selfishness kind of came in um, and the greed and, you know, they have a certain amount of monopoly power. So it's like, why do we have to, you know, care about our customers that much? So it, it's, it's that, you know, some of it's still, even in 2021, is that like executives still don't get the web, right? Like, <laughs> I guess executives are kind of like our politicians. They just keep getting older. So like, we never get to that generational shift where it's like, finally, we have like digital natives running companies. <laughs> I don't feel like we're there yet. Um, so there's some of it's just like, you know, if you, if you have executives that don't really understand the technology and what it's like to be a user, it's very hard to do good work. And, and then again, you end up with cultures where it's just everything, everyone's kind of doing things a little more for themselves instead of for the, the user. I think cultural is the key there because there's cultures of missing deadlines and moving fast that fear of, of not hitting those marks. There's fear of not being first to market. There's fear of failure in some cultures. There's fear of ambiguity, which uh, is another thing I'd love to talk about later on mm -hmm. when we start to dive into information architecture and how we can eliminate some of that early on. But but it is it's it's a cultural driver this this fear and the the interesting thing about fear is it only takes one person to be afraid for mm -hmm. that to amplify and yeah. that fear to spread through the entire team or the entire organization. And um, yeah, I, I'm just saying yes to what you said with <laughs> with a couple of extra words. Yeah. So, so I mean, maybe we can 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 jump into this since we seem to be edging around it a lot. Um, we can just jump into this pool of sort of the state of organizing things <laughs> in mm. digital spaces, mm -hmm. right? So, one of the things, just you know, when you were talking earlier about the farm and how you moved there and you got this house house uh, first and you check things out or whatever, it it reminded me of your you know book on planning, was it planning for everything, right? Yeah. Or of just sort of like, you know, this nonlinear way of doing things. I'm planning a move to Utrecht, um, to the Netherlands right now. It's a huge move for me, right? And I'm constantly reminding myself that I don't have to stick the landing on the mm -hmm. first move, right? Yeah. That like, just get into the vicinity of where you're, like get to the country, yeah. Get your belongings yeah. there, like, and then tune it once you arrive in that in that place as as well. And so, um, just this sense of m doing big things that have complexity, right, and understanding what steps to take and how to take them. In my mind, that married together with what I see as the state of let's just call it, for lack of something else. Um, Let's just call it experience design because I don't have anything else mm -hmm. to call it um, right now. And I know people love to argue about things and I don't really <laughs> care about definitions, but I'm just going right. <clears> to <throat> put the D word in there and put the E word in there and that the complexity of that. And, you know, everybody knows you, um, Polar Bear Book, uh, Information Architecture. And Andy and I were talking, you know, in advance of just how much complexity there is in this system of design. There's, and I, you know, there's user experience, there's um, just pure play design, there's information architecture, there's information architecture with a capital I and a capital A and a small mm -hmm. I and a small A, and there's big D mm -hmm. and little D. And in my mind, and maybe I'm overly simplistic, everybody's trying to do the same thing which is to develop products and services or create experiences or transactions, um, transaction possi transactional possibilities um, that allow people to interact online, to get work done mm -hmm. or to live or to get, collaborate, to enjoy each other's company, whatever that might be. Um, what do you see is going on in that space right now. I see a lot of, you said, you know, design center design, you know, designer center design. I see a lot of arguing in house about these things and not a lot of actually steps that could be taken to improve it. I mean, what do you yeah. think's going on in this debate space? Is it a legit debate? Does it matter whether or not we decide on these definitions? I mean, it's kind right. of a long, right. long question, but I mean, you've just been in this space for so long. What, what do you think's actually yeah. going on? 
Yeah. And tell and tell us how to fix it, Peter, and then we'll let you go back to your farm wow. farm and pulling yeah. logs out of ponds. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, why do you think I ran away to a farm in the first place? Farming, farming is easier than information architecture. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that, actually. Like, I, I have some appreciation for the challenges of farming already. Uh, my, uh, the, our, our farmer um, was telling me about the chemistry of farming, mm-hmm. right? And it, like, I'm not sure if he has more than a high school education, but he knows way more chemistry than I do. <laughs> Um, so I, I'll, I'll, yeah, but, um, wow, that's like, that's like such a big set of questions all lumped in there. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, it's okay. It's fun. Um, I, I think, uh, so let me start, I'll, I'll kind of start where you started with the planning, you know, planning and moving. And so like, I, I one of the themes in a number of my more recent books has been mindfulness and it's one of those topics that like everyone's eyes can glaze over like, yeah, yeah, you have to meditate, blah, blah, blah. And yet I think that the key to good planning and good information architecture is mindfulness because you have to be able to step back and be in a calm place, be centered and, and think about right with, with with planning right it's like what are my goals how do i want to do this um what am i actually afraid of um, you know what am i excited about um and go into it with a certain amount of flexibility and and, and recognition that improvisation is as important mm-hmm. as planning and you got to be ready to dance <laughs> um and that's part of the fun um and um and then with information architecture um, you know, the project I'm working on now, I'm just, I've done my user research, my background review, my stakeholder interviews, I'm going to shift into analysis next week. And I'm aware that there's probably between five and 10 major categories of things that can be done to try to make things better. And any one of those could also make things worse. <laughs> and so my challenge is to really try to think through what are the what are the two or three interventions in this very complex ecosystem that are more likely to do good than bad (laughs) because they've already been through years of trying and doing some good and doing some bad and now you've got an organization where people have change fatigue Mm -hmm. and just like oh no not not the next new technology that will solve all our problems so you know, I, I think that ability to step back and try to see things as they are, to be honest, you know, about our own limitations, right? Like, I don't have the information architect as superhero mental model anymore. Right? It's like, you know, it's, it's, the world is messy. These folks are going to end up having to solve these problems themselves. Maybe I can help a little. Um, you know, I think in terms of what's happening in the design world, the, uh, you know, the corporate world, like, I guess that's the thing. The design world has become the corporate world. That's how I would put it. When we were first practicing in the nineties, we were doing this cool new thing that like no one in business knew about. And they all wanted to hear what we had to say and they'd pay us to do stuff, but it was usually out of end of year discretionary right. budgets. Cause they're like, well, let's just see what, what the heck these people can do. And it was more marketing and brochure websites. And so their stakes were low and you could, you could actually like just do good information architecture because no one was, there was no politics. Now, you know, design is fully embedded in the corporate hierarchy and the politics and the culture. And so I, from my perspective and, you know, I I always try to, I hate it when people give conference talks or write books and they just like, they just like say things in in this really definitive way. This is the way things are. Um, uh, And, uh, and it's like, that's the way things are in one context, right? Like that's the way things are in startup world in Silicon Valley. Right. Like, but it is, you know, (laughs) that's not the way things are at the international monetary fund. Like it's a really different place. Um, so, you know, but from my limited perspective, 
of getting these various glimpses into different organizations. I just haven't seen much progress for like the last at least 10 years, right? It's like, it was like, there was, you know, up until maybe 2010 or around then, like, you know, so we had like, you know, 15 years of like, you know, every, every year you go to conferences and there's like new techniques and new ways of doing things and new people have like, you know, people have dug deeper into user research and there's some new, you know, and, and so you're learning and it's kind of, you know, I felt like as a kind of a, you know, if we want to talk, you know, call, call like, you know, the experience design field, right. As a field, we were learning and evolving and growing and, I have seen very little of that for at least 10 years. It's like, it's, you know, it, it, it you know, I don't know if that's just an inevitable um, <laughs> kind of, we've, we've basically gotten good enough. Um, uh, I'm not completely sure of all the reasons, but I just feel like, you know, I haven't really seen anything new in our field for at least a decade. And, it doesn't really bother me so much in a lot of ways. Like, um, like I'm really loving the project I'm working on right now because whereas like looking after this farm, I, I'm like, I'm a, I'm a total newbie. Right. I'm like, I'm like, I don't know how to look after cows. <laughs> like, you know, I know nothing. Um, which is exciting in its own way, but also can be very exhausting and stressful. Um, when I'm consulting, I feel totally confident, right? It's like, I've been doing this for 25 years. I'm really good at this. I've like seen, you know, you know, everything's unique in one way or another, but like, I've seen variations on, like, I feel, you know, I'm like 51 years old now and I feel absolutely at the top of my game when I'm doing IA consulting. Um, you know, I, 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 um, like my memory has shifted in some really weird ways as I've gotten older, but like in terms of how it functions in a, <laughs> business setting and kind of doing information architecture, I feel like I'm as good as I've ever been or better. Um, and so it's, it's actually really fun to do consulting right now. Cause it's like, Oh, I get to go do something I'm good at. <laughs> On the next episode of surfacing hosts, Lisa Welchman and Andy Vitale continue their conversation as Peter talks about his view on the world of information architecture and considers why IA seems to be less prominent as a practice than it was in the past. Peter also offers his view on what younger designers and architects need to consider as the baton is passed from one generation of designers and architects to the next. If you enjoy surfacing, please rate, review, and follow us wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also, consider supporting the podcast on Patreon at patreon.com slash surfacingpodcast. If you have suggestions for guests or a topic you'd like to hear about on surfacing, please reach out via the contact form found at surfacingpodcast.com.